Praise the Lord, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Oh, that's great. That's great. I thought there was a few more songs to come. I was told there's four. Okay, that's all right. That's okay. Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. This, you know, this, room, this tent takes me back years. You remember we went, Pastor McConnell and the old bishop went to the Armour Road, Armour Park, and uh, we had some great services in the, in the old tent in the Armour Park. It was, it was tremendous, you know, it was tremendous. And souls were saved every night. And it was, it was absolutely fantastic. The worship, the word, it was brilliant. And, nice. and if he was here tonight, I'm sure he'd be here. Isn't that right, Ricky? He would be here. He would be here every night. But he wouldn't trade one night. He wouldn't trade one day to be back with us. I don't think so anyway. He's in reality now, so he is. And uh, he's gone to the place where he always preached about for many, many years. He's gone to be with Christ, as the apostle said, which is far better. So I have one verse of scripture for you tonight I want to leave with you. But before I do anything, can we pray? Let's bring this service to the Lord in prayer again. Father, we thank you indeed for the sense of your presence that's already been said. We never take your presence for granted. Your presence makes the feast. And tonight we pray that you'll cover us all with the precious blood. We pray that this piece of canvas, Lord, will become a cathedral, will become a place your presence will dwell in and Lord, we will hear your voice. We love your word and we, we love your voice. And we don't want to hear the voice of a man tonight. We want to hear the voice of the living God speaking into hearts, speaking in the hearts of men and women and boys and girls. Oh, tonight, glorify your name, be lifted up. Let not one of your words, Lord, fall to the ground but let your name be glorified. Your word says, the Lord, Paul plants and Apollo waters, but it's God that gives the increase. So tonight, we're asking you, Lord, will you give us the increase, not for our sakes, but for your honor and glory. Let time stand still for these next few minutes. In Jesus' lovely name we ask it. Amen. One scripture I have tonight is found in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It's a well familiar known verse in the Bible. I'm sure you could quote it off yourself. It's the words of the Apostle Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit where he says these words. Therefore, if any man, or any, that word man is the generic. It doesn't mean just man, it means woman too. If any person be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. I want to read it from the Living Bible because it puts it in our kind of language. When someone becomes a Christian, they become a brand new person inside. He is not the same anymore. A new life has begun. I've not come here tonight just to preach on a verse of scripture or to bring a wee word. But tonight I've come to testify that this verse of scripture is real. It's authentic and it's genuine. It's the real deal. But tonight I've come to tell you what the Lord said in his word and what Paul said to the church at Corinth 2,000 years ago is real and relevant in our present 21st century. And not only do I believe that this verse of Scripture is real, but I have experienced it. I have tasted it. I have lived this verse and I live it out every day in my life. As the young people say, I wore the t-shirt. Someone, when I just got saved, asked me the question, how do you know you're saved? And I was only a young Christian at the time and I didn't know many scripture verses and I couldn't think of one. And when they said to me, how do you know you're saved? I retorted, I answered them, I was there when it happened. And if you get saved tonight, you'll know it because you'll be there when it happens. And I've seen this verse of scripture in a tangible form. I've seen it come alive with my own eyes. I've seen it working. I've seen it operating, not just in theory, but in practice. And I believe that this verse of scripture, this text with all my heart 
is the very word of the living God, and it works today in this 21st century, the 22nd of August, 2022, that if any man, if any woman, if any person is it being Christ, he or she is a new creature. All things, not lovely, the old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And say for a crazy moment, just lay, let's say for a crazy moment that this isn't true, that this scripture isn't true. Say for a moment that it's a fable, that it's defunct, that it's not doable, that it's out of date, that it's unnecessary, as old President Trump used to say, that it's fake news. And if that's the case, then let's forget about this whole book. Let's close the book, let's close it, and let's not stop, let's not continue to deceive, to deceive people any longer. But sir and lady and brother and sister in Christ tonight, regardless of who you are or where you're coming from or where you think you're going, this verse of scripture is the inspired word of the living God. This is not a throwaway statement. This is not an off-a-cuff remark. This is the word, the very breath of God, the very mind of God, the very will of God, and the attention of God. It's totally true and real and relevant, even in this God-cursing, hard-drinking, drug-taking, money-spending, anything goes. If it feels good, do it 20 first century. Listen, we are living in a broken planet tonight. And I'm sure when you look at your newspapers and you hear your, your television in the sky and the BBC, I'm sure you know that, that we are living in a broken world. Old Vance Hafner said, we're living in a rotten age. He says it used to be the Ice Age, the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Dark Age, and now we've got this rotten age. But even in a rotten age, so there's so much darkness and there's so much uncertainty. The scripture is still true. The word of God still stands and it still works. That if any man, that if any woman be in Christ, they are a new creature. All things are passed away and behold, all things, everything becomes new. That when a person gets saved, he becomes a Christian Everything changes. When a man and a woman comes to Jesus, they experience a great change in their life. There's not only a great transaction, but there's a great transformation. Not from without, but from within. Things will never be the same. You will never be the same again. And look at this apostle, the apostle Paul or Saul of Tarsus, the man who penned these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Paul never just thought those, these words up. These came in the spirit. These came under the anointing. These came, he was just the pen. He was just the pen in the hand of the Holy Spirit writing this words. And look at this man tonight. He was a Jew. He was a Pharisee. He was a true blue. He was a Hebrews of the Hebrews. He was schooled in the law of Moses and the prophets. He sat at the feet of a, a master tutor called Gamaliel. He knew what about. He was no communist. He was no God hater. He was no atheist. He was no agnostic. But he hated the gospel. And he hated anything that tampered with the middle wall of partition. Paul or Saul of Tarsus hated the church and he hated Christ's followers. Like old Voltaire said, I have nothing against Christ. It's his leprous bride that I am against. And Saul of Tarsus, before he became Paul, he hated the Christian church with a passion. And if you read the epistle, particularly in the book of Acts, we're told that he made, that Saul made havoc of the church. He wasted the church. He ravished the church. The Bible says healing both men and women into prison and didn't make a difference with men and women. There was no respecter of persons with Paul. He wanted to get rid of the church. He scattered them like the sheep that they were. And when you read of what Paul did to the church in the way of persecution, it makes up 26 verses spread over the epistles. He was bloody. He was bar barbaric. He was a hatchet man. He had blood on his hands. He showed no mercy. He was there when, he, when Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned to death. The Bible tells us they held the coats of the boys who were throwing the stone. He was an accessory to the fact. 
And even Paul in his later days said these words that I was separated from my mother's womb. <laughs> and even though he was separated from his mother's womb, God let him persecute the church. Work that one out. But while he was persecuting the church, the hand of God was upon him. Historians tell us between Stephen's death in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, until the church had rest in Acts chapter 9, verse 31, 2,000 believers suffered martyrdom. The Bible says that Saul, he consented to the death of Stephen. In other words, he gave a nod. He approved it. He was pleased with it. He was glad. Only a hard heart can do that. Is anybody I'm speaking to somebody here tonight? You've got a hard heart? The Bible talks a lot about hearts, broken hearts, sad hearts, hard hearts, sinful hearts. The Bible says that the God, God is a God of the heart. Oh, he's a great heart surgeon, so he is. He's a great heart physician tonight. Do you hear me? No matter what's wrong with your heart, he can fix it. He can mend it spiritually. He can do that. He can change your heart. The Bible says in the book of Ezekiel, he can take the heart of stone, make it become a heart of flesh. Isn't that lovely? Oh, he can soften a heart. He can tenderize a heart. He can cleanse a heart. He can make a heart all over again. Old Fergal Sharkey in my days used to sing, a hard heart is hard to find. A good heart is hard to find. Listen, you'll find it in the gospel. You'll find it with Jesus. And God, look what happened to Saul of Tarsus. Look what happened to him. God met him on the Damascus road. You ever read that? God met him. Listen, God will meet you on your road that you're on. Is it a Jericho road with me? It was a sure road in Belfast. But whatever road that you're on, God will meet you. You might be on the road to no town tonight. You might be on the road where there's a cul-de-sac. You might be on the road where there's a bend and you think you're going around the bend. God will meet you on whatever road you... God will meet you on the broad road tonight. And he'll put you on the short and narrow. Hallelujah. God can meet you on the road tonight. And God met Saul of Tarsus and he saved him. Hallelujah. Can I hear an amen? God saved the hardest of the heart. He was a tough nut to crack. And you might be sitting there tonight, sir. And you may think you're a tough nut to crack. But listen, God can soften your heart. And God can change your life. And no one believed it. According to historians, it took a lot of years for even the church to accept that Paul was saved. You know, it took a lot of years because they thought he was a spy. They thought he was going to trap them. They thought he was going to give information and all the way where the church was worshiping. And it took a while for, for the church to accept Saul. Paul's life was never the same again. The menace became a missionary. The great sinner became a great saint. The Jesus and the gospel hater became Jesus Lo the lo lover of the gospel and the lover of Jesus. And time fails me tonight to tell you how the Lord turned his life upside down, or should I say, he didn't turn it upside down, he turned it the right way up. Is there so many here tonight, sir? Listen, God can turn your life the right way up. Do you hear me? You mightn't have a clue how he's going to do it. You don't, it's none of your business. But if you give your life to Christ tonight, God can turn your life the right way up. His life, his world, his eternal destiny was changed. Paul became what he was talking about, what he was writing about. He became a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Why? Because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Listen, you can't out sin God's grace. Do you hear me? I don't care who you are tonight. I don't care what you've done or what you're going to plan to do. You cannot out -sin God's grace. And there's nobody here tonight too bad enough to be saved. You hear me? I'm going to say that again. In case there's someone sitting here, there's nobody too bad enough here tonight to be saved. And there's nobody too good enough. Nobody too good enough either to be saved or to know what's the grace of God. And listen, I don't care what kind of life you have tonight. It might be a happy life. It might be a horrible life. You might be doing well. You might be going through hell. But it's nothing compared to his marvelous grace. And everybody said, his, no, hey, no wonder old John Newton, that slave trader who got saved, wrote the lovely words, amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a wretch like me. Because of what Christ, and what Christ can do for one, he can do for anyone. Do you hear me? What he did for Saul of Tarsus, he can do for you. What he did for me, he can do for you. What he did for Ricky Bell, he can do for you. What he did for people in here tonight, or God's people, he can do for you. He can do for you. Because with God, all things are possible. And that's a guarantee. Listen to what he said in verse 17. Therefore, if we started off this wee verse, therefore, when you see that wee word, therefore, you've got to ask yourself the question, what's it there for? And, and, and if, you read the, 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 if you read the last four chapters and reading up to, coming up to verse 15 of chapter five, you hear talk, Paul talking about Christ's love constraining him. He said, I'm constrained by the love of Christ. Another word constrained means controlled. He's controlled by the love of Christ. What are you controlled tonight by, sir? What are you controlled tonight by, lady? What's driving you? What's leading you on? What are you getting up in the morning for? What's, 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 what's pushing you onward? What's controlling you? Paul says, what's controlling me? The love of Christ. The love of Christ. Paul couldn't look at a crowd without starting to preach. Paul couldn't look at a crowd without reaching out. Paul couldn't look at somebody poor without trying to meet their need. Paul couldn't look at a man with no coat without taking off his coat and giving it. Paul, that's how Paul was controlled. That's how radically and abruptly and miraculously Paul's life was changed. He, this love of Christ controlled him. And he speaks of how Christ died for all and rose again. And Paul loved preaching this gospel that he hated it. He, he hated the gospel, but he loved, he loved the dunamis of the gospel. He said it was my gospel. He loved to speak about death. In fact, he said he was looking forward. He said, for me to live as Christ, to die as, great, as gain. Paul said, I'm in a twix between two. To, to, do, to, live, to stay here, and he was in his middle 60s, to stay here and to work with his and build more church and win more souls. But to be with Christ... I'm in a bind. I don't know what to do. So he left the date of the Lord. He said to be with Christ, which is far better. Listen, on your deathbed, would you be able to say that too? For me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Hallelujah. You see, see, death, death, brothers and sisters, has not got the last say. Do you hear me? It hasn't got the last say, but it's going to come to us all. And I'm asking you tonight, when it does come, and if you never hear any words I say, if you never remember what I said tonight, listen to this. Are you ready? Are you ready? When death knocks your door, are you ready? Are you saved? Woody Allen said he, did, wasn't, he wasn't afraid, no, the comedian, he said he wasn't afraid, to, afraid of death. He just doesn't be there, want to be there when it happens. And I suppose that's like us all, isn't it? Christ died for all, Paul said. Then he talked about how he viewed Christ differently. From a Pharisee, he used to be a proud, arrogant Pharisee, taking the t crossing the T's and dotting the I's, and he was proud as a peacock. Pride's an awful thing, and Paul was proud. Proud as a peacock, as they say, and as a boozer, there's a peacock in every one of our hearts. But when Christ, <laughs> when, when Paul got saved, when Christ saved him, the peacock was replaced by a lovely dove, a dove. Paul was a Pharisee. He was a new creature and he loved Christ. And then he viewed his fellow man, his fellow countrymen differently, the Jew and the Gentile. He realized both needed salvation. And when he was writing to the Galatian church, he says, there's neither, there's neither male nor female, no gender in Christ, no gender, no Christ. They say there's 101 genders now, by the way. Can you imagine that? God said there's two. I'm on God's side, everybody said. I can't count up to 101 anyway. But, <laughs> but he says there's neither, listen, he said there's neither male nor female. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither orange or green. Hello? That's how Paul's seen them. Because Paul was looking through the eyes of God. And, 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 and of all of that became, uh, th because Christ came into his heart and changed Listen, he changed the furniture around. You see, if you come to Christ and you let, you let him into your heart, what he'll do? He'll change the furniture around. In fact, he'll throw some old furniture out <laughs> and he'll get you brand new stuff so he will. And Paul's life was completely 
changed. God changed the furniture around. He says, I am crucified with Christ. Paul didn't say, when I survey the wondrous cross. Paul didn't survey the cross. Paul got on to it. He says, I am crucified with Christ. I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't know many times Paul in his private life, and not even in the scripture, but Paul in his private life said that to people, I love the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You notice that? He loved me. That's personal. I know he loved the world. God so loved the world. But Paul said, he loved me. And I love old John, the disciple. No, John, the apostle John. He used to, he used to his calling card was John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Oh, Paul, John knew that the, that the Lord knew, loved all the disciples, but he, John said these words, he loved me. I know that he loves me. Do you know that the Lord loves you tonight, brother, sister, sir, lady? Do you know that the Lord loves you tonight? He said, therefore, and he says these words, if any man be in Christ, notice the two little words, in Christ. Now that's so important. It was Paul's favorite expression, in Christ. He mentions that little, those little two words 130 times in the New Testament. The concept was first spoken by the Lord Jesus in John 15 verses 1 and 2 when he said, I am the true vine. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. To be in Christ is like Noah and his family when they stepped into the ark. When Noah and his family stepped into the ark, they were enclosed. They were insulated in the ark. They were separated from all ungodly influences on the outside. They were supplied with all their needs they needed. They were secured and sheltered against the storms of judgment that was outside the ark. Not a drop of judgment water fell on them. It all fell on the ark. And you know who our ark is? Can anybody tell me who our ark is tonight? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And that's why he says, in Christ. Are you in the ark tonight? Are you in Christ? Maybe Christ is in you, but what a pastor, what about Michael? What about Christ in me? Yes. But not only is Christ in us, but we are in Christ. And that's what Paul... That's what it meant for Noah and his family to be in the ark. And that's what it means for a person to be saved. Listen to Jesus' words in John chapter 10. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Now what do you hear this? Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You're in his hand tonight. You put a 50 piece piece in my hand and then close it. See if you can get it out of it. Well, that's like us. We're the 50 pence piece and we're in the hands of Christ. I bet the Bible says Christ, we are in Christ and Christ is in God. And there's God. And that's how secure we are tonight. That's how safe we are tonight. Nothing, neither devil nor demon can pluck, can pluck them us out of his hand. In Christ is to be united with him. In Christ is to be at one with him. All our strength to live the Christian life is in him. Listen, he keeps us. I hear people saying when I'm witnessing, oh, I couldn't keep it. You're right. You can't keep it. But he keeps you. It's not the shepherd. It's not the sheep that look after the shepherd. Sure it's not. What is it? It's the shepherd that looks after the sheep. And you're a wee sheep tonight. And you know what sheep are like don't you? you know what I mean? These are country people. You know what sheep tonight are like. And that's, and that's how God, that's how God, that's how the Savior looks upon him. He gives us the strength to serve him and he keeps us. He is the source of our life. The Bible says in him, in him, we live and we move and we have our beings. To be in Christ means to be his new creation. He's He's got his designer. We're his designer label. His DNA is all over us. What he said to Jeremiah, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. <laughs> uh, Pastor McConnell used to say, before you're a twinkle in your dad's eye, God knew ye. <laughs> you remember he said that? Right? He did, he did. And he does. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, he said to Jeremiah. Listen, and I ordained you. Before Paul, even while Paul was, was, was torturing the church and persecuting the church, 
God knew him. God knew him in his mother's womb. It's marvelous the mysteries, the mysteries of God. To be in Christ means to be justified from sin. To be in church is not enough. Oh, I go to this church and I go to that church. Huh? My name was on the roll. My old bishop used to say, your name might as well be on the sausage roll. It's, it's, you're not getting in. You need to be washed. You need to be saved. You need to be born again. You need to have an encounter with Christ. You need to be forgiven. You need to know it. You need to be there when it happens. If you're not there when it happens, you weren't saved. To be in church is not enough. To be on the church roll is not enough. To be in the denomination is not sufficient. To be a proud prod tonight is not enough. To be a Roman Catholic tonight, a devout Roman Catholic, it's not enough. You fall short. You fall short. It's only in Christ that we are saved from sin and from judgment and have the joy of sins forgiven. And it's only in Christ. And I'm going on a bit, a bit, bit about this, but it's so important. It's only in Christ that we have passed from darkness unto his marvelous light. From death unto life, no judgment, no wrath, no hell. Huh? It's only in where we, when we are in Christ, we are ready to die. Can I ask you a wee question then? I've asked you before tonight. Are you ready to die? Be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Think about that. Are you ready? Are you going to wait till the doctor tells you some bad news before you start getting ready? Give your life to Christ now. Don't waste your life anymore. Give your life to Christ now and be ready. Be in the state of preparedness. Be in the state of readiness because we don't know how we will go. It could be sudden. It could be prolonged. But let's be ready anyway. In Christ we've passed from life unto darkness and we are ready. And it's only in Christ that we are new creatures. Can we honestly say with certainty tonight, I am in Christ. And if you're not in Christ, see if you're not in Christ, you're in trouble. You're still in your sin. You're still not saved. And if you're not saved, sir, and if you're not saved, lady, the Bible tells me you're lost. You're lost. And you're lost for time and eternity. Let's move on. Notice what Paul says, if any man, any person. You see, God's love and mercy is wide enough to encompass everyone. He's got a queer pair of hands. Do you hear me? He's got a queer pair of hands. Listen, it's like an ocean. It's like an ocean without a shore. The gospel says, for that whosoever will, whosoever believeth, 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believeth on me out of his belly shall flow scriptures, as the scripture says, shall flow rivers of living water. It doesn't matter who you are tonight, what you are, what you've done, or what you're going. This verse is inclusive to everyone. None is left out. Jesus kept, went around saying, Come unto me. Couldn't see a crowd without saying these words. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You know his favorite word was come? You know what his favorite word is? Come. C-O-M. C stands for the children. O stands for the old people. M stands for the middle-aged. And the E stands for everybody. Come. Come. Come on to me. Come on to me. Why don't you come tonight? Why don't you give your life to Christ? He loves you tonight. You hear me? He loves every one of you. He loves, the, he loves the last. He loves the lost. He loves the least. He loves the laugh, the left out. He loves the lowest. He loves the up and out. He loves the down and out. Doesn't matter whether you're from Helen's Bay or Tiger's Bay. He loves you tonight. He loves you. He loves you. And he went all the way to the cross to die in your room instead. And the very fact that you're here tonight is no accident. You hear me? God doesn't do random. I've found that out in my life. God, nothing puffs into God's head. Oh, we will do that. That's an alternative. I'll maybe change my mind. No, God doesn't do 
random. Oh, Michael, you may say I'm here tonight. I'm, I'm, I've been invited here tonight. I'm here. I've, I just came for a wee nosy. I have nowhere else to go tonight. Uh, you could be sitting in the house tonight, couldn't you? You could be watching the TV, which I was, Pastor, to be honest with you. Sick of listening. Uh, you, you could be doing other things, but you're not. You're here. You're here in the tent. You could be sitting in a bar tonight or at a club right with your friends, but you're not. You're under the canvas cathedral. Why are you not in hospital bed tonight? You could be in some prison cell tonight. You could be in the grave tonight, but you're not. You're here because God, do you know why? Because God in his love and in his mercy planned and arranged so that you would be here tonight in the providence of God. You're here for a purpose. Nothing's wasted. You may be sitting there tonight and say, I'm wasting the time. Nothing's wasted. Nothing. Even remember when the Lord was feeding the 5,000 and what did he say after he said, after they were fed? He says, gather up the fragments. Make sure there's nothing wasted. God doesn't waste anything, particularly according to his word. He doesn't waste anything. Notice the word says, if any man, if any woman, if any person. Are you saved tonight? I'm going to ask you, keep asking you. Are you saved? Are you in Christ? Would you like to be saved? You can be saved. You may be saved. Jesus will save you. The apostle says in verse 5 and verse 15, these words, he died for all. See that word all, know what it means? All of us. There's no one left out. If any man be in Christ, He's a new creature. He is. Notice that. There's, there's, listen, there's no, doubt, there's no doubt here. Paul's not given. There's not, no ambiguity. Uh, there's no think so, guess so, hope so, maybe. He says, present tense, he or she is a new creature. So positive, so certain. Maybe tonight. And tonight we were made new, not just by the power of God, but we are made new tonight by the grace of God. Isn't that lovely? Oh, he uses his power, but he uses his grace. You see, when he made the soul world, he made it by his power. But when he saves us and redeems us, he does it by his grace. He does it because he's bestowed favor upon us. Not because we deserve it. The opposite. Because we don't deserve it. See, when we were born in Adam, we were born with Adam's genes. G-E-N-E-S. And man is not a physical problem. Man is a spiritual problem. We are not a body with a soul. We are a soul with a body. And that's why no medicine or no wonder drug or no power or no psychiatrist or no talk can take away our sin. Even God can't talk. Even God who spoke to talk to the world in their existence, God said, let there be light. God doesn't talk away our sins. Our sins are of a greater magnitude that even he couldn't speak redemption into existence. It took the life and the blood of his dearly beloved son on the cross of Calvary to save you and me. It took the suffering of Jesus and the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. God paid an incalculable price for you and I tonight. And here I'm up here pleading with people that are saved. If somebody did it with me, and we hesitate, and we're slow, instead of running, running to the cross, running to the place of refuge. Blessed be this. See, when God made you and me, he made us to create and love and worship God. Man's chief end, as the old catechism says, is to glorify God and endure him forever. But because of sin and because of the fall, man was cut off from, from God, the source of life. That's why the Bible says we were dead in trespasses and sin. We were without hope or God in the world. We were in bad shape. And sir and lady tonight, if you're not saved tonight, if you're not right with God, if you haven't repented of your sin, you in bad shape. We were born in Adam. We have all Adam's nature. That's why it's so easy to sin. We sin naturally. A child sin just doesn't think, just comes so easy. When I, when I got saved, I had a terrible mouth on me. I had a filthy mouth on me. And, and even when I was playing football, guys used to say to me, Bonds, what, what's that? I, I didn't even know. I, I was doing it naturally. It came so easy. 
And I was born with that. That's why Jesus said, you must be born again. You must be born again. And that born again experience involves regeneration. It means the new birth, which actually means a person is regened. You're regened. God takes Adam's old genes and he puts his genes in us. And we have been regenerated. The life source is flowing back into the individual person, which constitutes a marvelous, miraculous change. And that's why the book of Ephesians says, we put off the old man and we put on a new. Just like you put on a coat. You know, you put on a coat, you take off a coat. The Bible, Paul talks in Ephesians chapter four about taking off the old man and putting on the new man. Blessed be his lovely. And the Bible calls it the new birth. Paul calls it the new creation. Don't you want to be made new tonight? Anybody here want to be made? Anybody want to have a clean heart? And anybody want to get right with God? Huh? Like David says, cleanse me, O Lord. Search me, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Give me a clean heart, O God. And renew a right spirit within me. God's looking for clean hearts tonight. And only he can clean them. Only he can clean them. It's all in Christ. Notice what he says. I'm almost finished. All things, says the apostle, are passed away. Old things are passed away. Isn't that lovely? The old things. Everything that's old. Before you, the old life before you got saved. The old desires. The old sins. The old addictions. The old habits. The old impulses. It doesn't mean to say you'll not be tempted after you get saved. And you'll maybe weaken a few things. But listen, he'll give you strength to come through them. We're not born under sinlessness, but we do sin less. And when I do sin, I remember when I got saved, and as I said, I had a terrible, I had a terrible dirty mouth. And I remember one time getting in an argument with somebody. I shouldn't have got into an argument. I should have walked away, but it's hard to walk away sometimes. And I said a swear word. And then I, before I got saved, I had to say a swear word. What the, what the fizz on me? But I remember saying a swear word. A boy, it was like the Lord smote my heart. I had to get to the cross. How to say, Lord, will you forgive me? Listen, I'd give anything. And I'd give a million pounds just to know that joy of forgiveness. But I didn't have to give a million pounds. He, he forgave me. And he put the joy back in my heart. You know, the old places we used to go to, they're all away. The old pride, the old self-righteousness, the old self-centeredness, all things are passed away. You can say like the old hymn writer, gone, 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 gone. My sins are gone. The old things that dragged you down, the old things that brought you shame and guilt that didn't satisfy. You can say like the old hymn writer, I've tried the broken cisterns, Lord. But ah, the waters fail. There's things that I used to do and the taste were lovely. But see, when you get saved, no, they're like gravel in your mouth. Gravel in your mouth. My wee wife, when, I, when we met and we got married, she got saved too, and she used to love the smoke. She said, they used to go up the, she used to go up the stairs in the bus. Remember years ago, you were able to go up the stairs in the bus because everybody smoked? She just went up and smoked, sat and got the, the smoke in there, you know what I mean? And she smoked cigarettes, but when she, when she got saved, they made her sick. Even the smell of it. I've heard men who used to drink, I used to hear them going by the bar and had to go across the road because of the smell of the drink. That's how God saves you. God does a work of grace in your life. He doesn't just half save you, not half baked. He just doesn't lead you off the garden path and leave you there. He takes the old things away, the old things that don't satisfy. And he, 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 he listen, he cleans the slate, is wiped clean. No condemnation. The Bible says, therefore, there is no condemnation who are, they, who are in Christ Jesus. I'm in, there's no condemnation. I'm not, he's not going to point the finger at me. Point the finger at me at Calvary. God's not out to get even with me. Get even with me at Calvary. I'm a child of God tonight. Everybody said. And listen, you can be a child of God too. You can be a child of God tonight. The old sin, the old things are passed away, washed away, and all things are become you. Are you not tired of the old things? Are you not tired of the same old, same old? Sometimes when I got saved, when before I got saved, my, li my life was like a hamster. I was like a hamster wheel. You know when a hamster runs round, 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 round. You live in one week to another, and one year to another. And you're making nothing in your life. And you're missing out. And your life's been wasted and fettered away. Get rid of the old things. He can take the old things away. He said, what am I going to do with the old things? He'll take them away. Leave them with him. And behold, all things become new. 
What a transformation. What a miracle of sovereign grace. Brand new, yeah? Someone said that education informs. Governments reforms. The world conforms. Sin deforms. But only Jesus Christ can transform. <laughs> Is that right? He can transform your life. He can transform your very destiny. Do you remember the night you got saved? You believers out there, do you remember the night you got saved? Do you remember the night you got gloriously transformed? I did. My night was turned today. And it wasn't on the Damascus Rose, I said. It was on the shore road. And I was a different person. I was a different person. I remember I got saved that night. I was only 17 years of age. And I got saved in a, a Wrangler jacket. Anybody knows a Wrangler jacket? Sit behind a Wrangler jacket. Beetle, anybody with a Beetle boots? Oh, you're giving your age away there. And the Wrangler jeans. Huh? And the Ben Sherman shirts. <laughs> and I walked down to the front. The pastor called people there to see. And I was 17 years of age. I had the orange badge and all the Rangers. And I, and the tartan scarf and all on. You know, the old shawari wara, you know, the, huh? What do you call them guys that sang, uh, I forget their name. Well, I was there, huh? Bay City Rollers, I heard you, Mrs. Bay City Rollers, you're right. We were there. And I gave my life to Christ. I went down the front and he says, what do you want? So he said to me, the pastor said, what do you want? I said, I want to get saved. He said, do you mean it? I said, I do you mean it? And he prayed the sinner's prayer. And I remember going up, I lived on the shore road, same in Vernon. I was twinned with Iraq at the time, so it was. And I went, I walked up the Whitewell Road, and there was 10 of us in the house. And uh, um, on the Sunday night, my mum used to go to bed early, God love her, and read the Sunday papers. And I remember going up there in their room, and I sat in the bed, and I said, Ma, I have something to tell you. And she was reading the way, she never even put the paper down. I said, I have something to tell you. She says, what is it? I said, I got saved tonight. I got my life to Christ. She put the paper down and says, you'll keep it for a fortnight and put the paper up again. <laughs> well, that fortnight turned out to 51 years. Hallelujah. You know He saves and he keeps. I didn't keep myself. I didn't keep myself. He keeps me. And I love him tonight with all of my heart. I was made a new creature in Christ Jesus. Listen, the Lord Jesus loves you, everyone. I love that wee hymn, I love the wee song, Jesus loves me, this I know. But I always turn it around and say, Jesus knows me, this I love. Huh? Jesus loves me, this I know. Jesus knows me, this I love. And listen, tonight he loves you. He still loves the unlovable. He can still touch the untouchable. He can still reach the unreachable. And he can still forgive the unforgivable. He still gives a chance to those who have no chance. He's an unchanging changer. No one ever stood beside him and walked away the same. And what he did for them, he can do it for you. Am I speaking to someone here tonight? You're not saved, you've never repented. Someone whose life's a mess. And only you know that. Why don't you give your life to Jesus? Listen, don't waste the rest of your life you don't have to go out of this tent the same way you come in. You can leave tonight with a Bible in your hand, a Savior in your heart, and a purpose in your life. Because the Word of God rings loud and clear tonight in this gospel tent that when someone becomes a Christian, they become a brand new person inside. They are not the same anymore. A new life has begun. And that new life doesn't stop there. That new life leads to eternal life in Christ Jesus. And may God tonight bless his word to our hearts. Will you bow with me in a word of prayer, please? Would you bow with me just, just for a few minutes? Thank you for listening to me tonight. But we're gonna, I wonder tonight, I know most of you, well, some of you, I don't know most of you. There's some new faces here. I was going to say there's some old faces, but that would be the wrong word. Some familiar faces. And maybe you're a man tonight, a woman, a young person. You've come into the tent tonight and you're not saved. Maybe you were here last night. You wanted to come to Christ and you went home and you said, I'd love to put my hand up tonight. And you're here tonight in God's providence and God's goodness. And you still got that feeling on you. You might not have that feeling next week, but you've got it tonight that you want to come to the Lord. Oh, why don't you come to the Lord? Nobody's watching but me. 
doesn't matter who's watching anyway. When I got saved, I walked out to the front. I didn't care who was watching me or who wasn't. I needed saved. I was a desperate man at 17 years of age. I needed Christ. But there but one tonight. A young man, a young woman, a man or a lady, an elderly person, whoever, and you'd love to be saved. You're tired of being sick and tired. You're tired of the same old, same old. And you want to come to Jesus. Is there one? Would you, would you raise your hand for me? Would you raise your hand? We'll not call you out to the front or anything, but we'll pray for you. Is there one tonight? I'm not going to hold the appeal very long. So if you're going to come, come. The minister dying out of the service, come tonight. Is there one? Is God speaking to you? Is God dealing with your heart? Do you feel your need of Christ? If you don't feel your need of Christ, don't come. Don't come. Only if you want to come. Only if you feel you need him. Only if you feel you're tired of who you are and what you're doing and where you're going. And, and you know one day you're going to die. You're going to die without Christ and you're going to go out into a Christless eternity. Is there one here tonight? Lift up your hand quickly. It takes a man, it takes a man or a, and a woman to be a Christian. Any, any, any old boy can run around and drink and smoke and gamble and get on and waste his life but it takes a man and a woman and say yes yes I love him, I love the Nazarene is there one tonight is there one go and ask again, is there one more time, is there one would there, would there be a backslider here tonight would there be a backslider pastor, what's a backslider, a backslider is an Old Testament word a backslider is someone who tasted and seen that the Lord was good but because of circumstances or situations or whatever you don't follow the master anymore. You threw the cross off. You don't follow him anymore. But he never leaves you. And just because you run away from God doesn't mean to say God runs away from you. God doesn't run away from you. God runs after you. And God runs before you. And that's why you're here tonight. That's why you're here tonight. So for the very last time, please lift up your hand high and say, yes, pastor, I want to come to Jesus. I want to give him a life. I want to give him a heart. Is there one tonight? Before I go tonight, if you want to see me after the service or see Pastor Ricky or whatever, have a wee talk with us. Maybe you need a few answers to your questions. We'll do our best to help you. But listen, only the Lord can help you tonight. Let's pray a wee blessing. Father, bless your word unto your heart and glorify thy precious name. And if there's some poor soul tonight who's wanting to come, but are hesitant. Lord, may they just come. Come, may they come to the Savior. And make no delay. Come to the Master. And Lord, their lives will be completely and abruptly changed. Thank you, Lord, for this time in your presence. Bless as we pray the rest of the service. In Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.